What I'm going to do now is try to reconcile the various origin narratives of Marvel Boy by first examining the initial story from 1950 and then looking at the changes introduced with each new iteration. I will follow this up with another video in wherein I cover current Marvel Boy canon up through Secret Wars 2015. Starting with Marvel Boy No. 1, published by Atlas Comics in 1950 and written by Stan Lee, we have Matthew Grayson, who is a professor specializing in atomic energy. In 1934, he was married with two children when a tyrant named Hitler rose to power. Hitler lost the World War, but not before Professor Grayson's wife and daughter became two of his victims. Their commercial plane was shot down when Nazi anti-aircraft gunners mistook it for a military plane. This is the only version of the story where Robert's mother is in a plane that is shot down and his sister is never mentioned again. Too depressed to continue his work or live life on this planet, Professor Grayson used his knowledge of atomic energy to secretly build a uranium-filled rocket ship that would take him and his son to the moon. He tells his son that if they don't make it, then they'll be no worse than living on this cruel planet. Depressed widower, father, with stockpiles of uranium, building a nuclear-powered spaceship in what appears to be his backyard, with plans to leave the Earth with his infant son and go live on the moon. And... He's doing all this by himself 25 years before the first manned space flight. Sounds legit, right? In 1934, Professor Grayson and son blast off. To everybody on Earth, it is as though they vanished into thin air. The rocket traveled at an incredible rate of speed as it climbed out of the atmosphere. To quote Professor Grayson, faster than light itself, tens of thousands of miles a second. Professor Grayson is most likely exaggerating the speed if they had been moving up to the speed of light, which he claims that they have exceeded. Um, this would place them arriving at Uranus in just under three hours based on going at the speed of light and a distance of 1.7 billion miles from Earth. Professor Grayson loses consciousness between the Earth and the Moon, but comes to a short distance from the Moon, only to find that their craft has been drawn into a new gravitational orbit. Turns out the uranium powering the ship is being attracted to the immense concentrates of uranium that form on the crust of the planet Uranus. All of that is complete comic book BS. Upon arriving on Uranus, the Graysons discover a war-free world already populated with brilliant and noble minds. The Uranians were like angels, good, helpful, and ultra-intelligent. Their ultra-intelligence led in turn to telepathy. Professor Grayson never forgot about Earth, and once his son was grown, he assigned him the mission of saving Earth from self-destruction by combating all evil elements, political and criminal, who seek to destroy it. His son, Robert, understood and felt an obligation to help the Earth in its troubles. Besides, he was curious to see the world that he was born on. Robert was warned that he would be smarter than most men on Earth and that his telepathy would enable him to reason with any creature in existence, but that he would only be capable of running a little faster and fighting a little harder than mortal man. In order to keep his strength up, Robert is required to take a uranium pill every 24 hours due to the difference in atmosphere between the two planets. Without the pills, he will be weaker than any mortal man and may even die. His father then gives him a large jewel that will fire a beam of light that will temporarily blind an enemy. Robert is warned that he must not kill unless defending innocent life. This jewel is then attached to his wristbands. Finally, his father presents him with a uniform and a flying saucer spaceship capable of crossing the interplanetary void in a matter of hours and across the Earth in a matter of seconds. It's powered by a specially developed hydrogen-uranium compound that's inexhaustible. Professor Grayson chose this day because of a new continent has risen out of the sea and he is afraid that all the nations in the world will fight to control it. He's basically afraid of another world war breaking out. He asks his son to keep the continent out of the hands of greedy men so that its appearance doesn't become disaster. As Robert flies off, his father remarks he is a born helper of humanity. A Marvel boy. Robert then spends the next three years thwarting villains and fighting evil on both Earth and Uranus. Two facts I didn't seem to get squeezed into everything there are, first off, that Horace often calls his son Robert Bob, and that Marvel Boy's day job on Earth is that of an insurance claims investigator. 
All of this forms the core origin story for Marvel Boy, which will be added to and taken away from over the next 60 years. The story picks up again in 1975 with the publication of Fantastic Four Volume 1, numbers 164 and 165. Marvel Boy's father's name has been changed to Horace instead of Matthew, and it will remain Horace until the 2010 Marvel Boy series, wherein he is given the name Matthew Horace Grayson. After three years of helping out on Earth, Marvel Boy visits banker Calvin McClary to take out a loan for badly needed medical supplies in his father's name. Although sympathetic to his cause, Calvin says that there isn't any way that his board of directors would believe that Horace Grayson is still alive and living on another world. It took time, but eventually Marvel Boy was capable of getting the supplies he needed and returned home to Uranus, where, is, where he's shocked to find that the Dome City is in icy flamed ruins. Marvel Boy is immediately afraid that everybody has been killed in, uh, in war or there's been for some form of sneak attack, but upon investigating the scene, he discovers that natural forces have destroyed the Omni Dome. He becomes angry and stricken with grief about not getting there to help or at least having the opportunity to die beside those he, he loved, and all because he was detained on Earth by a hard-hearted banker's rubber stamp. Marvel Boy flew to Earth, intent on vengeance, but his ship strayed into the tail of the comet Kahotik, which by freakish accident hurled him into suspended animation for several too long years. That last bit of wording of several too long years is a direct quote and implies that Marvel Boy was conscious of the passage of time, but couldn't move due to the suspended animation. The comic Kahotek doesn't uh, mean much to us in a cultural sense today, but was a household name at the time of the mid-70s. And as it was heavily hyped as the comic of the century and showed up in numerous pop culture references, including Time Magazine and the Peanuts comic strip. Eventually, he crashes to Earth when Earth's gravity pulls his ship free of the comet's grip. Once back on Earth, Marvel Boy changes his name to the Crusader. The Crusader takes the next year to prepare a series of attacks. His plan is to kill Calvin McClary, the same banker that turned him down for a loan and destroy his financial empire. Over that period of time, he learns how to use wristbands to give himself super strength and create concussive bolts of light in addition to blinding flashes he uses Marvel Boy. Because he's using the bands to give himself super strength, the Crusader no longer needs to worry about taking a uranium pill once every 24 hours. On his first attack, the Crusader nearly kills Calvin McClary with a hurled mass of concrete. Over the next month, he successfully attacks a number of Grover Cleveland National Bank branches, but oddly, he never steals anything, showing that these attacks are orchestrated to incite terror and not personal financial gain. Calvin's wife recognizes the Crusader as Horace Grayson's son due to the familiarity of their voices. She had heard Dr. Grayson speak when he had come into the bank and attempted to get a loan to finish his rocket. A loan which is denied. Too bad he couldn't sell the bank any of those uranium stockpiles he planned on using to fuel his ship. Reed Richards uh, notices that the Crusader only attacks on sunny days and sets up a radiation grid to track the Crusader's wristbands. Soon the Fantastic Four track the Crusader down to a bank in the Bronx. The Thing and Human Torch uh, keep the Crusader busy while Reed creates a cloud bank which cuts the Crusader off from his source of power. In response to the cloud cover and waning energy reserves, the Crusader turns his bands up but when the clouds disperse themselves, he ends up taking in an overload of solar power, which turns him into scattered random atoms. All that is left behind is a pair of broken wristbands. It is interesting to note that it is Calvin McCleary who turns Dr. Grayson down for a loan not once, but twice. Once when he sought financing for his rockets, and again when Marvel Boy sought to bring medical supplies back home. It would be eight years before there is another mention of Marvel Boy. The official handbook of the Marvel Universe, Volume 1, published in 1983, takes most of Quasar's entry and uses it for Marvel Boy and the Quantum Bands. On top of that, though, Marvel Boy still gets his own entry uh, the following year as part of the same volume in the official handbook's Book of the Dead. 
We are told that originally Horace and Robert's last name was Grabsheed and not Grayson, and that Horace was a German Jew who immigrated to America shortly after Hitler began his rise to power. Robert's b- place of birth is listed as Trenton, New Jersey, so he must have been born after his father emigrated. Robert's mom is listed as deceased, but we are given no cause of death. Her father's profession has been changed from professor to rocket scientist. Previously, Horace was building a rocket to go to the moon to live. Instead, the plan is to orbit the moon until he deems it safe enough to return to Earth. Before he can finish the rocket, he comes into radio contact with a colony of Eternals living on Uranus. The Eternals are a divergent race of hominids created by the Celestials. I'll go into more depth on Celestials, Eternals, and Deviants in a later video, but the key info here is that the Eternals come from Earth and they're not native Uranians. In the original origin story, Horace Grayson had designed the rocket ship all by himself, but for every version moving forward, it's going to be the Eternals who provide the plans for the spaceship. I'm not saying that this makes complete sense, but it definitely makes a lot more sense than Horace doing both the designing and building of everything by himself prior to there being a spaceflight program. Upon arrival on Uranus, Horace and Robert are both given special gravity-resistant bracelets in order to reduce the intense gravity on the planet Uranus. The original Marble Handbook is extremely clear on the fact that both Robert and Horace are given an identical set of bracelets. Later, before going to Earth, Marvel Boy is shown how to regulate his bracelets to be used as weapons. This is important because if the story had stayed like this, then that would mean that there were potentially multiple copies of the Quantum Bands on Uranus. When Robert Grayson takes on the mantle of Marvel Boy, he returns to Earth in his father's ship, now refurbished with Uranian technology as opposed to before when he returned to Earth in a brand new ship given to him by his father. This portion of the narrative will remain the same moving forward, along with the readopting of the name of Marvel Boy's ship from the 1950s, the Silver Rocket. This time Marvel Boy gets the loan he sought, but the process takes weeks and by the time he returns home the dome has already collapsed. He believes that he might have been able to save the colony if he had not been delayed by a certain banker. This is the only version of events wherein the Crusader kills Calvin McClary, and this is the first version in which Marvel Boy is said to wear polarized contact lenses in order to protect his eyes from the blinding flash of his wristbands. Additionally, this is the first time we get any background information on the Quantum Bands, which are listed in the Weapons Guide as Quasar's wristbands and have yet to be given the name Quantum Bands. It turns out that the Eternals set their colony on the site of a weapons depot left by the Kree, and it is believed that the bands are ancient Kree artifacts and that they permit the wearer control over gravity and at least some of the electromagnetic spectrum. The bands at the end of the story are taken into custody by Reed Richards, who later passes them on to Stark International, where Stark employee Gilbert Vaughn gives them to his son Wendell to test. A year later, in 1985, the deluxe edition of the official handbook to the Marvel Universe was printed, and again, Marvel Boy is given an entry in the Book of the Dead. Since this came out only a year after the last edition, most of the Marvel Boy story is just simply a copy and paste job, with a couple of exceptions. One point of note is that we're told that Robert Grayson's mother died during childbirth. The other point of note um, is a rather large deviation from the story so far. The handbook states that Marvel Boy is given three different sets of the bracelets during his time with the Uranians. The first both Graysons are given in order to help them adjust to Uranian gravity. The second set Grayson wore as Marvel Boy and those allowed him to fly and absorb and reflect light as a weapon. He wore the third and most powerful set as the Crusader, which also gives him super strength and allows him to shoot concussive energy beams. The official handbook states, The wristbands appear to be miniature versions of the vast stellar generators, which provided the Eternals the vast heat and energy needed so far from the sun. Whether that was something that the Eternals themselves built or if it was leftover Kree technology from when they had their weapons depot set up there, we're not told. 
And in the end, Reed Richards takes custody of the of the wristbands and um, lacking time to investigate them, turns them over to S.H.I.E.L.D. This is pretty much the same as before, but removing Stark International as an intermediary. The next version of events shows up in Quasar number two. This version stood as canon for close to 20 years, and in retrospect, the entire story is suspect. Death Urge reveals himself to Quasar on Uranus shortly after Quasar has discovered the ruined city of the Eternals. Quasar is feeling depressed, and Death Urge wants nothing more than Quasar to give in to his feelings of oblivion. With that in mind, it should come as no surprise that the version of events Death Urge gives us probably isn't true, or at the very least is a, is a warped version of what took place because he's telling the story with the intent to further depress Quasar, and he isn't concerned with giving a factual account of what took place. Since this entire version of events is suspect, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to cover it here, but I will go over it in detail once I get around to covering Quasar. The next version of events is laid out in 1991's The Official Handbook of the Marvel Universe Master Edition. Unfortunately, I do not own a copy of this or the 2009 Handbook of the Marvel Universe. I would love to get my hands on a copy of both of these to see what they have to say, because the handbook that's sandwiched right in between them is the 2004 Official Handbook of the Marvel Universe, The Golden Age, which is the shortest entry I found in the series. Given its brevity, it's rather surprising that this is the only Marvel handbook I own that mentioned Marvel Boy's friends Pete Mason and the telepathic Star Rider. This version also states that for a short time, Marvel Boy got super strength from taking uranium pills. This is an odd notation considering that this is the first mention of the uranium pills since Marvel Boy left the pages of Astonishing in 1951. That's over a 50-year gap. The newest revision of the story comes by 2006's Agents of Atlas and 2010's Marvel Boy the Uranian, and will bring us current with the Marvel era up to Secret Wars 2015. What I plan on doing in the next video is to take everything we've learned from the 70 years of Marvel Boy origin stories and combine them with the modern narrative to give us a comprehensive view of Robert Grayson as he currently exists within the Marvel 616 universe. If you like this video, please hit the buttons below. Did I leave anything out? Please let me know by commenting below.